All right, we're going to run through the study guide on utilitarianism here. So these are going to be uh, my thoughts on the various principles uh, and criticisms uh, related to utilitarianism. It's the same theory that Sandel is uh, discussing in his book. My take on it is going to be that, be my take on it, from the kind of specific training and teaching that I had in my own education, which really is pretty similar to what Sandel is doing, but I'm kind of offering this as a kind of different discussion of the same ideas. So you can kind of see his discussion, mine, they overlap quite a bit, but that gives you more perspectives to approach a very dense theory that has lots of things to be said about it. So I'm kind of intentionally giving you my own personal lecture material uh, alongside and in addition to Sandel's I don't see any conflict between uh, his take and mine. It just brings out some different aspects, and, and many of them are the same. So I just wanted to say that right off the bat, and I kind of intentionally do that to kind of enrich the overall intellectual landscape, as you might put it. Um, okay, so here we go. Okay, so we're going to take a look at question number one and two here, and... Kind of three broad things that we can think about for both of these questions <clears throat> is what does it really mean to say that utilitarianism is either hedonistic or consequentialist? It's both. So what do we mean to say that? What is that as opposed to, right? Like hedonistic as opposed to what? What's different from that? And also, what's the motivation? Why would a philosopher kind of advance that kind of view? What speaks in its favor? What makes this seem like a plausible answer to a philosophical question, as opposed to the other different alternatives one could go for? So I'll try to say a little bit about um, one and two with those kinds of variables in mind. <clears throat> So to say that it's uh, utilitarianism is hedonistic, that means that the basic units of analysis of the utilitarian moral theory are pain and pleasure. When I say the basic units of analysis, I really mean this, what it's analyzing. The things being analyzed, being theorized about, being spoken of in the theory, fundamentally are units of pain and pleasure. And as we will see in the next thing, Actions, the next concept, uh, question two, actions are going to be deemed important because of those hedonistic outcomes, we might say, because of the effects that they have in terms of pain and pleasure. And that's really the bottom line analysis, is the effects that the actions, policies, and decisions have in terms of pain and pleasure. Let's say for uh, a, a non-hedonistic theory, could say something like this. Um, maybe we could, this might be kind of odd, but let's say if we were just kind of like a mathematically obsessed culture, we could uh, evaluate the, if, the goodness and badness of actions and think about w what we should do in terms of how much Every action benefits the overall mathematical knowledge of mankind. That would be non-hedonistic, at least in this sense. It would, um, the basic units of analysis are items of knowledge and how widely distributed certain states of knowledge are. And that's really an intellectual state rather than a pain or pleasure state. And yes, there probably is some pain or pleasure that would go along with being in that intellectual state. But still, still we're, we're really focusing on a much different kind of state of a person, right? Not their hedonistic states, but rather pure states of knowledge. And you could think of other alternatives to pain and pleasure that a theory might evaluate. You might also evaluate things like how fair of a distribution, how fairly a certain policy affects all people, 
that that measure of fairness is not going to be given in terms of pain or pleasure, but let's say maybe just in terms of earnings or let's say in terms of accessibility and opportunity, maybe kind of dignity and respect. These are all things that aren't pain and pleasure, although you know, the utilitarian is going to come along and say, but you know what? All of those things matter to us because of the pain and pleasure that they bring us. So shouldn't we really say that the ultimate item that we're analyzing is the pain and pleasure produced by our actions in a moral theory? So that's kind of a long um, way through there, but it's really a pretty interesting and fundamental kind of question to ask. Um, so those are some alternatives. And here, what are the motivations? Why be hedonistic? Well, Jeremy Bentham opens utilitarianism with a very stout affirmation that pain and pleasure are the two grand bases of all human action. He says they govern us not only in what we ought to do, but in what we actually do, and that we're kind of chained, even as he says, to these two kind of fundamental masters as the you know, ultimate powers of human motivation, our pain and pleasure, and that's just what we are. You know, he's saying that's the kind of creature that we are. So if you're going to have any kind of realistic ethical theory, you're going to need to be not only talking about pain and pleasure, but that's going to be the fundamental thing that drives the human experience and human decisions and human life. And that's just what they think is a realistic answer. So um, that is a lot, <laughs> really, to behind uh, what, uh, what is involved in saying that utilitarianism is hedonistic. Uh, let's kind of quickly uh, look at the second one to say that it's consequentialist. So here the fundamental mm, distinction or contrast uh, would be really with saying that morality should be based on internal motivation rather than external consequences. So that, that would be the contrasting view. What we might say a motive-based, internal-based ethics about what's going on internally within the agent performing an action as what we use to evaluate the action itself. The consequentialist says, no, no, no. What we should evaluate an action according to is only the consequences that it brings out in the world for other people. The effects on other people and the consequences of your actions are what matter in terms of what we should use to evaluate it, right? So like, well, on what basis should we evaluate an action? Is it the internal motive and the intent that matters? Or is it the external consequence that matters? The utilitarians are, I think, admirably upfront and say it should only be the consequences of the action that matter when we evaluate the moral status of your action. The internal motivation, you might think, well, gosh, doesn't that matter a lot, you know? And the utilitarian is going to have a hard time with this. At some level, they have an easy answer. And they can say, well, yes, of course, motives and intentions matter, but only in terms of the consequences that they bring about. There's really no kind of empty mattering of motives and intentions where that has no, no bearing in consequences. That, I think they might say, well, that doesn't matter. Intentions and motives that don't bear any actual consequences, that doesn't matter, they want to say. So that's um, one basis of, um, say, the um, motivation, you could say, uh, for, the, for the consequentialist position is that you know, the consequences of an action is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. That's where you get the real oomph, the mattering of human action is how it bears out in other people's lives and in the world, right? Intentions are great. But that's not really where the real impact on the world is happening until or unless you act on your intention. It's just kind of there, you know.
So they think that that's uh, really a point in its favor, is that even though we're kind of ignoring something that a lot of people think matters, motives, and intentions, um, as having any intrinsic importance, I think they can see themselves as being realistic, uh, kind of grounded ethical theory is like, well, that's where things matter, you know, so the impacts on other people's lives, and that's what we should really have our eye on in doing ethics. So putting these two things together, we get this idea that utilitarianism is hedonistic consequentialism, and the utilitarians defend both of these like fundamental commitments in ethics. And as we'll see, Kantian theories, libertarian theories, Aristotelian theories go in different directions in these fundamental commitments. So I spend some you know, considerable time going over these basic elements of the theory because it's these basic commitments that really differentiates the different theories that we're going to look at, like a motive-based Kantian deontological theory and an Aristotelian virtue-based and character-based moral theory, these all differ from utilitarianism on these fundamental issues. And because they differ here, as we'll see, they differ on so many other issues. So um, this gives us a glimpse into arguably some of the most fundamental questions that a f philosophical theory of ethics can ask itself. In daily life, we don't spend as much time thinking these parts through as much, perhaps, but we're not you know, developing a philosophical theory of ethics, usually, in daily life. And this is the kind of thing that philosophers and real theorists spend a good amount of time on because you know, everything else kind of like feeds from this. You know? Like they say, blues is the roots, everything else is the fruits. So these are the kind of roots of utilitarianism, and we'll go on to look at some of the fruits. All right. Okay, so here we're going to look at the distinction between an intrinsic good and an instrumental good. And we will also look at the specific characterization of intrinsic good that Mill uses throughout his theory. So we'll say here, uh, the most basic level, an intrinsic good is something that is good for its own sake or as people will say, goods. Okay, moving on here, uh, it says state the principle of utility. It's actually a few different versions of it. I'll just kind of go through them in uh, kind of increasing complexity, getting to like the final version. Um, and then we'll look at um, this question number six really raises a question about the principle of utility that's kind of hard to answer. So this is a nice example we're first seeing as a kind of a way of challenging a philosophical principle. Number six is kind of like raising that in a, in a way. Um, <clears throat> so I want to kind of bring that out. So state the principle of utility. Uh, the principle of utility has like three different versions of it. And Mill himself kind of goes through a few different versions of it and Bentham had different versions of it. Different utilitarian philosophers have slightly different variants. So I think it's important to see that this is a fundamental principle that has a number of different formulations. And it's difficult to know exactly what the right formulation is. So starting with the most intuitive, kind of clear version of it, is that um, it, an action is morally correct only if it maximizes utility. So that gives us a necessary condition for the moral correctness of an action given in terms of whether or not it maximizes utility. In the last question, we looked at the concept of utility. Now we just really introduce the idea of maximizing utility, and we get the principle of utility. That, that adds something, not a ton. Uh, we'll see it's a little more complicated than it might strike us at first, simply to add the idea of maximizing utility to this concept of utility itself. But that's really the idea, as we'll say, um, a nice clear criterion for what counts as a morally good action is that it's utility maximizing. 
That's what makes an action good. So if it's utility maximizing, if it's utility maximizing, then that's a morally good action. So really, the utilitarians will put this out, and this is where we get some differences, either as a necessary condition for a morally good action, or as both necessary and sufficient for being a morally good action. In either case, we can see this is the fundamental criterion for morally good action. For this reason, uh, Mill will often say this is the supreme principle of morality. It's the principle from which all more specific moral principles will follow. For example, um, uh, let's say uh, the, the, moral, the, the moral or legal status of abortion, or the death penalty, or taxation, or any kind of subsequent moral issue that we would raise is going to be ultimately based on that fundamental moral criterion. That's why it's the supreme principle of morality, because there's lots of specific principles that we will guide our life with in day-to-day -day living, and those get answered by this. This is what gives basically all the answers to all of our moral questions, but we have to work out the details. And that's going to be a whole thing itself, but this is the fundamental moral criterion of good action, and of course of bad action as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we can say this, any action that isn't utility maximizing is not a good action. Um, we can you know, think about how to phrase the not good, does that mean immoral, or that you could have been doing better than you are, or how do we want to phrase that? We can kind of worry about that later, but it gives us you know, a criterion both of morally good action and of, well, action that isn't morally good. So we have that there, maximizing utility. So now that we know that utility is happiness, we can give a little bit fuller version, right? Now we're looping back to the earlier definitions and seeing why this kind of bears fruit as a theory. Things are kind of interconnected ideas. So um, we can say then that our moral obligation is to maximize happiness for all people impacted by an action, and only then do, does our action count as morally good. That's what it is to, com to commit a morally good act, is to maximize the utility, therefore maximize the happiness of all people in, impacted by your action. Um, going one step further, since we know that happiness for the utilitarians is defined in terms of pleasure, we can say that our moral obligation is to maximize the overall ratio of pleasure to pain of all the people that are impacted by your action. And that gets us to something that we can really quantify at this point, at least the utilitarians are thinking. Now we can kind of really put some concrete sense to when our actions are right and wrong, because we can, you, know, you can see when you're causing people pain or pleasure, or whether you're experiencing pain or pleasure, that's real concrete stuff. So now we can really kind of hook this theoretical criterion of right action to something very concrete in the world, namely the consequences in terms of pain and pleasure in the outcomes of your actions on everybody, including yourself. But as they say, in the principle of utility, you count as one, but no more than one. Everybody's pain and pleasure is to be reckoned equally as important. So that's a kind of sense in which they respect people equally. That's how they think of equal respect, is that everybody's pain and pleasure is on the table, so to speak, as much as anybody else's. And it's just, you just add up all the pain and pleasure. It's not supposed to matter who's pain and pleasure it is, but that the overall quantity of your action for everybody, when you put it all together, is the most. And that's the criterion of morally good action. So they um, use these definitions that we've been going over to frame a fundamental criterion for what a morally good action is. And I've been emphasizing your action, your individual action, and that's certainly what they have in mind here but um, they also believe that this is what should motivate 
government and legislation. That's an act of a collective body, right? An act of government, just as much as an act of the individual, ought to be judged on its utility, right? What's the utility for the people of this act of legislation? That's how we determine the goodness or badness of the act of legislation, just in the same way as we would the goodness or badness of a private individual action of a particular person. So this is just as much a basis for decision making and of evaluation of individual actions as of government policies. And that's very important for the utilitarian. This is how we should be evaluating the goodness or badness of various uh, policies and legislative actions of government bodies. Okay. <clears throat> So, I have this question here. How can an action create the greatest amount of happiness, but not the greatest number of happy people? So this is really looping back to what do we mean by maximizing utility? We want to say that's our fundamental moral obligation. What does that really mean? To maximize utility. So, we might see these two different senses of maximization. One way to maximize utility, now we know that utility is going to be defined in terms of happiness, is to make the greatest number of people happy. Let's say your individual action might make four people happy if you decided to go out and have certain plans on Friday night with four friends or something like that. Um, that's different from the amount of happiness that each of those four people is experiencing. So that's a question of how happiness is distributed, how many people are made happy. There's another question that we call a question of aggregation. In the aggregate, how much happiness was created. Not how many people were made happy, but when you just pool the happiness of all the people that were made happy, what do you get? And one strategy for thinking about what maximizing happiness is, is that it doesn't depend on distribution of how many people are made happy. The only thing that matters is the pool, the aggregate of happiness produced, not who gets how much of the happiness. Just what's the overall greatest aggregate. So that becomes very important, actually. That becomes a part of a series of objections that utilitarianism is subject to. And we'll get into those in later questions. Um, but there's a famous example of this that I think nicely brings this point home by Derek Parfit. Um, he says, you know, imagine having a million dollars to distribute to whomever you wanted. And you know, in some ways, we do the same kind of thinking in an estate or a will. You know, let's say like you're towards the end of your life and you have to think about how to distribute your assets to you know, whomever. You can put it in a will. Um, same kind of thinking in both cases. The Derek Parfit case I, I like, it's kind of an extreme case, of the uh, case of wills and trusts. Um, he says, you know, imagine that you've got a million dollars and um, you have to give it away. You've got two options. You could either give one dollar to one million people and you would have made one million people happy that way, you know, let's assume a little bit happy, you know, a, a dollar happier, nothing wrong with a dollar, sure. And you do that for a million people. So you've made a million people happy in your decision to give, with your one million dollars, one dollar to one million separate people. Or, your other option, is that you could give the million dollars to one person. They would be made very happy. Oh my God, 
They would be made so happy. A million dollars. Yay. Well, you've only made one person happy, but you've made them extremely happy. So you can make a more dramatic version of this. Make sure I've got my math correct. Yes, exactly. Let's imagine that actually you were given a third option where you could give a penny to a hundred million people, right? Now that might not work anymore as a good example because a penny might be a burden at this point. You have to kind of like what do you do with a penny? But, you know, let's assume that you've kind of made them a penny's worth of happy. There we could say you've made a hundred million people happy with your million dollars. In the other case I just described, you've made one person happy by giving them a hundred million dollars only one person. So the argument here is that one could argue that you've created more happiness in the world overall by making one person happy, giving them the million dollars, than by making the hundred million people a little tiny fraction bit happy, or even by making a million people a dollar's worth of happy, so to speak. Um, they're kind of boosting their happiness level just by the amount of what one dollar would contribute. You know, arguably you could say putting all that little mm, modest happiness of a dollar, pooling it together, it just adds up to less of a, an amount than the intense happiness of that one person that gets the million dollars. So we could boil it down to the wills and trusts case. If you had three heirs, let's say, and let's say you had a million dollars to pass down to your three different heirs, how would you do that if you were going to maximize utility? So benefit your heirs as much as possible. Would you give each of the three an equal amount? Or you know, let's say some of the heirs, you're really unsure whether they would be able to make good use of the money that you were to give them, let's say because perhaps they've got a history of being irresponsible in these ways, um, or not even being able to tend to their own happiness. Maybe they even do disreputable things with money. I mean, Unfortunately, because some people have family members that, that do that. Should you really um, bestow or bequeath uh, an equal portion of your trust, I mean financial trust, your money, uh, to them in a will, um, if the, let's say, the utility that they would create with that money is lower than the utility one of their siblings or one of your other people in your estate um, might create if you were to give them their share, right? What if you gave one person double share and you left one out because they probably wouldn't create much utility with that just because of, you know, like they're the one in the family or something like that, right? So you can imagine an even more extreme case. Maybe there's two people in the family that, uh, you know, they're just kind of like, Either they're too irresponsible to manage the money or resources well, or they might even be have ill intent, you know. Um, and one, one, let's say, is a promising doctor that is very likely to have a cure for cancer that would greatly benefit humanity, but they kind of need this money to be able to go through med school and to be able to do that, but they would, you know, radically benefit humanity. In that case, we could clearly argue that you would be benefiting humanity, therefore maximizing utility, by making one person happy more than if you made three people happy. And thus, in the way that you would design your own will, or something like that, and you were being guided by the principle of utility, these questions of maximization come into play. We'll see that there's a downside to just going with what I'm calling the aggregation version of maximization where it doesn't matter how it's distributed because well in fairness and justice I think distribution matters right if we're talking about the state 
not your estate and will, but the government. I mean, arguably, the government should be focused on how things are fairly distributed for everybody and everybody involved in really morality itself, whether it's in the government or not, should pay some attention to how that happiness is distributed, right? Not just that one person is getting such an intense version of it that that kind of drowns out the other voices. Uh, so we get these problems about like minority voices throughout uh, utilitarianism because you know, even you know, benefiting the greatest good for the greatest number sounds really good, but if you're not part of that majority voice, utilitarianism has some difficulty explaining how we can still give you proper moral consideration if you're not part of this kind of benefited majority. That we seem to be able to justify, you know, benefiting the majority at what cost. You know, so that raises that there's a lot of questions uh, involved in how we want to understand that maximization. Is it just as total aggregation and it's not a question of who has it? Or um, should we have a distribution requirement in our understanding of what it is to maximize happiness? So it's what do we really mean by the greatest good for the greatest number? How we want to understand that. Alrighty. Okay, we're moving on to 7 and 8 here. This is a very famous distinction of Mills between higher and lower pleasures. There's also lots of objections and questions to be raised about it as well. And it gets into some pretty interesting terrain. So, I'm going to have to set this in a context uh, because... This distinction between higher and lower pleasures is a response to a criticism of utilitarianism. So now we're really getting into a kind of separate wing of utilitarianism. Now we're looking at responses to objections that were raised to the utilitarian moral theory of Bentham, Jeremy Bentham, the original proponent and defender of utilitarianism, Mill is now kind of taking the throne for Bentham and addressing various criticisms that arose to his original version of it. One of them is called the Doctrine of Swine. And Mill gets into this kind of right away in uh, his essay on utilitarianism, small book, and it's called an essay, where he says, many have argued that utilitarianism is a mean, groveling theory worthy only of swine. So what does that mean? Um, basically, this is a direct criticism of the utilitarian theory of happiness. It's called the doctrine of swine objection. It's well known. You can kind of seek that out. Doctrine worthy only of swine. That means that the way utilitarians are defining utility as happiness and then happiness as pleasure that seems to reduce human happiness to the same state of pleasure that a swine, a pig, a pig could en enjoys itself just by having lots of physical pleasures, rolling around in the mud, slopping at the trough. That's happiness for a pig, and it's really nothing more than physical pleasure. At least that's one way of thinking of it. That's what the objection has in mind here. Pigs are, you know, happy when they're rolling around in the mud and slopping at the trough. However, human beings, they should be considered happy in a much different way. Human beings have higher, more elevated faculties, like reason and emotion. And when you explain what human happiness is, you have to include those in a very central and important way, right? <clears throat> human happiness, not pig happiness, has to involve human rationality, human decision making, the human kinds of emotions, pride and shame, embarrassment. And what we see, on the other hand, is the utilitarians 
seem to conflate the happiness of the two. You seem to be conflating the happiness of a pig <laughs> with the happiness of a human being, which has a much more elevated, sophisticated nature, and thus happiness for that kind of creature has to include those more sophisticated, higher elements. We call them you know, higher faculties. And the utilitarians seem to miss that. They seem to get it wrong. They simply seem wrong about human happiness to the extent that by defining it in terms of maximizing pleasure, we just seem to be like reducing it to the happiness of a different kind of animal, right? So that's the worry that Mill is responding to in making this distinction between higher and lower pleasures. This is why he was motivated to introduce the idea. So what is it? <clears throat> Mill says, the person that's got the misunderstanding here is not the utilitarian misunderstanding the nature of happiness. Oh no. The misunderstanding here is on the part of the people that raise this doctrine of swine objection who seem to simplistically assume that all pleasure is physical pleasure or bodily pleasure. Sure, uh, that is a important kind of pleasure. It's the kind that we seek out, and that's one of them. But so too are there emotional pleasures and pleasures of the intellect, intellectual pleasures. There's at least these three fundamental different kinds of pleasures. The emotional and intellectual pleasures we'll call the higher pleasures. The bodily pleasures are lower pleasures. So that comports with right this idea of higher and lower faculties. So we can say the higher and lower pleasures are the pleasures that we get from the you know, activation and skillful development of our higher faculties or our lower faculties. Those produce higher and lower pleasures, respectively, depending on whether it comes from a higher or lower faculty or capacity, right? So the easiest way, I think, to lay out the hierarchy, the higher and the lower, is there's pleasures of the intellect, like let's say the kind of pleasure that you get when you get a math problem correct, or when you learn something, knowledge, right? Learning and knowledge. Uh, there is something pleasurable about that, usually. Um, and that's, you know, that we can say is a kind of a cognitive pleasure or an intellectual pleasure. There's also emotional pleasures like love, friendship, uh, pride, respect. Uh, these are things that we value. And, you know, there's an intellectual part to all of that. But I think we kind of call those intellectual, uh, not intellectual, but emotional pleasures. And then, of course, there's what, you know, people might call sex, drugs, and rock and roll pleasures or, you know, the kind of pleasures that... Um, are more similar to what a pig can enjoy that are just like, let's say, the feeling of the sun on your skin. If you're out at the lake and enjoying a nice summer day and you're having good food and it's not particularly emotional, it's not particularly intellectual, it just feels good. It's nice, you know, just basic physical responses rather than emotional responses or intellectual responses are what produce your pleasure. So this, you know, this seems to make sense. Uh, we do seem to get pleasures from different kinds of life activities, and those life activities have a greater or lesser expression of the intellect, the emotion, and just the physical body. So we can kind of map out what we might call this taxonomy, kind of a list of different forms of pleasure. So they're not all the same, and the person saying, you know, raising this doctrine of swine objection seems to have the simplistic idea of pleasure that they're all the same, they're all physical pleasures, thus the kind that the pig can have. But no, 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 human beings have this whole array of pleasures, and when the utilitarian uses the word pleasure, it's used in its full sense, right? The full um, extent and array of pleasures intellectual emotional and physical are what we mean when we state the principle of utility and when we define happiness in terms of pleasure. So we could say properly understood the utilitarian theory of happiness 
given hedonistically in terms of pleasure actually does make perfect sense. And it gives us a reason to value education, uh, poetry, uh, the cultivation of the arts, all those kinds of things uh, that develop our higher faculties because uh, those are the higher pleasures. Those are the more valuable ones. Mill is here saying that they're not just different pleasures, but the intellectual pleasures are higher and better and more valuable. And we ought to promote those above the lower pleasures. The lower pleasures are still pleasures and they're still forms of the good, but they're a lower form than either emotional pleasures or intellectual pleasures. So when we do decision making, we should be aiming to bring about the most intellectual pleasures as we can, and then emotional pleasures after that, and then lastly are the physical pleasures. This is what some people would call like a serial ordering or ranking, kind of a hierarchy of um, different of these different species of pleasure. So it's not just saying that there's these different kinds of pleasure and different things bring different people pleasure, right? Um, but this is more contentious. He says some are better than others, and a good moral action is the action that promotes the better, higher forms of pleasure over the lower ones. And you know, there's a lot of things that speak in favor of that, but now we're kind of really evaluating and judging what makes different people happy and evaluating different people's happiness. Your happiness comes from the activation of intellectual um, parts of the self that, that seems to value your life more in the utilitarian calculus than if you get happiness from more physical pursuits or emotional. So it's not uncontroversial to make that hierarchy. And you know we can even make that reflected in utility calculations, calculating the utility of an action by giving kind of weighted variables that reflect the hierarchy of pleasures. You under, kind of understand that idea of weighted variables. You can actually express this hierarchy in the utilitarian calculation, the kind of pure mathematical part of it. So there's an interesting question of how do you defend this ranking? Like, okay, Mill, you say that intellectual pleasures are better than the emotional pleasures, which are better than the physical pleasures. But why should that stand for everybody, right? Isn't that just your individual judgment of the kinds of life activities that you value more or that some people might value more? Why should this be a standard that is applied to people that have more, let's say, they have more, I'm trying to say here, their, their life is oriented more towards the emotion or towards the body, right? What's wrong with, is there something wrong with their lives? So there's a lot of interesting moves here. Mill, Mill kind of raises some questions and answers them. And so he gets really into the whole, you know, back and forth on objection and response here over this whole issue. Um, he says, well, you know, of course, you know, we can see, what do you say to them? Many people pursue the lower pleasures, the so-called lower pleasures, right? Lots of people go for physical pleasures. So what, uh, what do we say to maybe the majority of humanity that actually pursues the so-called lower pleasures? Are they wrong, uh, Mill? So he says, well, you know, people can, can raise this point. And I say here two things. Um, you can be an adequate judge of the relative value of a pleasure only if you've experienced the full range of them. Or between two pleasures, really you're only a kind of adequate judge of the which one is better than the other if you've experienced both. That makes sense. Like how could you really evaluate the quality of an experience that you haven't had, right? So uh, Mill says, you know, the for people that haven't had the intellectual pleasures, I guess they're not really in a position to be an adequate judge as to whether they're better or worse until or unless they've had them. So 
let's just kind of make that point that really we want to kind of put this to you know who is the adequate judge of these. It's only if you've had the full range of experience. So I guess in a way he's kind of saying not everybody's opinion matters. It's kind of like I don't know, it's not a little judgmental really. But um, he goes further, and I don't think I really buy this to be honest. He says when we put the question to adequate judges of which is better or worse, namely those people that have experienced the intellectual pleasures, he says down to a person, everybody would put them above the emotional and the merely physical pleasures. And I don't know, it's kind of like a blank check. I mean, is that, is that right? Um, got a couple points here. Um, we might then say, well, you know, wouldn't, couldn't we imagine somebody that got a college degree and went to, went to uh, cultivate their intellect and those intellectual pleasures, but let's say decided after college uh, not to pursue a degree in engineering, but rather to, to become a rock star. Actually, I think the band ELO, Electric Light, Light Orchestra, it's a kind of an old 70s band, uh, they used to be engineers, and they literally got a rock and roll contract and decided to become rock and rollers. Um, they've experienced both, but they, you know, they seem to kind of, with knowledge of both, pursue the rock and roll lifestyle over the intellectual or, you know, engineering lifestyle. So Mill says, yes, that happens. So what, in lots of cases, there will be people that know the intellectual pleasures, but end up choosing the physical pleasures. He says that just means that we have weakness of will. It's a very well-known thing. You know, it doesn't mean that our judgment puts the physical pleasures above the intellectual pleasures. It's that we're not acting according to our better judgment when we know both, but we go for the physical pleasures. So he says, yeah, a lot of people do go for the physical pleasures that have knowledge of both, but those people are putting the intellectual pleasures as highest through weakness of will. They're led to pursue the near easy to get physical pleasures that are tempting. You're just kind of following victim to temptation, and yeah, that happens, right? So the mere fact that we see lots of people that would give a different ranking, like if you went and asked people, would you give the same ranking as Mill? Um, I, I should say this, uh, not so much the ranking, but in terms of the fact that we see a lot of people that pursue like their actual life, their decisions, go for the lower pleasures, doesn't mean that they wouldn't give the same ranking, that's what I meant to say. Um, if we were just to kind of sit back and have a kind of a cool judgment of what we really honestly believe is, is best, uh, we might very well put the intellectual highest but end up pursuing the physical. So Mill has this fa famous way of putting it to people that think otherwise, I suppose, if you don't agree that the intellectual pleasures are highest. Uh, think about it this way. Would you agree to be turned into a pig rather than a human being where you would be guaranteed the full satisfaction of a pig's life. You'd have the best possible pig's life or you could have a kind of eh, medium, eh, medium human life, not like you're know, the best possible life for a human being. Let's say like a medium human life. Um, would you trade that in for the best possible pig's life? The way he puts it, would you rather be a satisfied swine or a dissatisfied Socrates? This is kind of a famous way of putting it. Where you're an intellectual, but your intellectual pursuits are kind of disappointed in a way. Socrates like, didn't find the knowledge that he sought. Um, so that's his way of you know, really asking, would you trade in a decent human life for the best possible pig's life? And you know, he says, I assume my readers will say no. They wouldn't trade that in. And what that really shows is that you value intellect over physical pleasures and the kinds of things that come from intellectual capacities and are the part of our emotional life that's fed by our intellect more than the part of our emotional life that's fed by our body, you know? So he says that should convince the reader that actually they would make the same ranking 
as I, John Stuart Mill, that intellectual pleasures are best, then emotional pleasures, then physical pleasures are last. So there's a lot there. Um, and this is really where utilitarianism becomes an interesting, sophisticated theory. Right? It starts off with these very kind of basic intuitive definitions and principles. And in response to criticisms, you know, uh, you know, rational, logical questions about, you know, how do we understand a certain parts of this utilitarian theory, it's kind of forced to get more complicated. And now we're getting into the kind of thorny, complicated part of it. And, you know, purposely, uh, I want to kind of get us now into that more intricate, philosophically sophisticated part of it. And it gets complicated. It does, you know. Um, this is where philosophy gets complicated here. And we can see it's kind of growing out of a, you know, intuitively decent theory uh, in the early parts in terms of the definitions and the you know, maximizing the greatest good for the greatest number. It sounds good. Uh, maximize happiness for people. So there's questions to be answered, as always. <clears throat> so... Now we have in question eight another distinction between act and rule utilitarianism. It's going to be somewhat complicated again, but this is kind of well known in the literature. You can Google act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism just like you can with higher and lower pleasures. It's out there. Um, so let me again introduce the reason for this distinction as John Stuart Mill responding to another one of these criticisms. This is a tough criticism. It's one that we've looked at a little earlier. I uh, just kind of gestured at it. And Mill is going to kind of raise that worry and respond to it and say how the utilitarian can actually handle this criticism. So um, you can call this, um, I call this the problem of distributive justice. Problem of distributive justice. And this kind of gets back to the question of maximization and whether maximizing utility requires making the greatest number of people happy or just that greatest total amount. Remember that? So here, it's intro that's introduced, it's kind of used as an objection to the theory that it's essentially it's just unfair, and it allows sacrificing the one for the many. And therefore, it allows violating individual rights for the sake of the happiness of the many. No, 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 you can't do that. At least that seems to be a pretty fundamental part of thinking about ethics and morality is that you can't just sacrifice a person by violating their rights where they've done nothing wrong, even if that really does end up benefiting more people than if you didn't violate their rights. So this is what we would call the problem of utility maximizing rights violations. By that I mean the problem of those cases where we can actually maximize utility by violating a person's rights. So that can happen. We can do that, right? Um, there's common sense kind of ordinary cases uh, like this. And there's also some kind of like famous thought experiment cases. And I'll give a quick little uh, discussion of both. Um, <clears throat> let me see where we can violate rights but maximize utility. Here's an example. Um, if you steal from somebody but you gave to the needy, with what you took from that person. So maybe it's kind of like Robin Hood stealing, right? Um, arguably, I mean, you can make a good case for this. You're maximizing utility by giving something to a needy person, taking it away from, let's say, taking it from a wealthy person, giving it to the needy brings about more overall happiness than if the wealthy person just keeps everything of what they is rightfully theirs, and the needy person continues to be needy, you'd actually maximize utility by giving to the needy. If you do that maxim utility maximizing action by stealing, 
that's violating that person's rights, property rights in this case, but it seems utility maximizing to do that. There might also be cases where we lie, right? Um, I think the famous case of like Anne Frank, you know, kind of lying to the German, not the Nazis that come to the door, right? Um, <clears throat> or for your own benefit. Where actually the, the, you know, the outcomes are actually, for everybody, are better off in some cases it would seem. So um, how, what do we say about these cases where we benefit the majority by sacrificing a minority? So um, here's one famous case that kind of people discuss. And um, then I'll look at the distinction between act and rule utilitarianism that Mill makes to show how he responds to it. So think about this. If you were a doctor and you guided all of your doctoring business, your doctoring decisions, by the principle of utility, what would you do in this case where you've got one fully healthy patient, and you've got five terminally ill patients. Hmm, what should I do? Well, if you're really a utilitarian, you're going to do whatever the principle of utility says you should do, which would be to bring about the greatest happiness for everybody involved, that's all six of your patients. Well, how do I do that? Well, I could either just kind of let the five terminally ill patients die until or unless I can come up with their kind of saving, saving measures for them and let the one healthy person live. Or, ah, plan B, I could actually harvest the organs from the one healthy person against their wishes without their consent and will distribute those organs to my five needy patients I being the doctor here, and let's just say those organs would keep those five patients alive. You've just kept five people alive, and let's just say they'll go on to live fine lives. By killing one person, uh, you, you certainly violated that patient's right to life and all other kinds of rights, no doubt, by you know killing them and harvesting their organs. Though, you know, you've you certainly maximized utility more than had you simply let the five healthy patients die and only one person live. So that seems to be a kind of scary example of utilitarian doctoring, right? Of bringing about the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, well, you know, what about, uh, what if you're in a kind of minority population and the overall population is benefited at your expense. Should we really tolerate them? That seems to sanction some pretty immoral behaviors. And, you know, what's a utilitarian going to say? You can't just say, like, oh, it's moral to just go around and, like, violate people's rights all the time, even if it would kind of benefit the majority more in some cases, you know? <clears throat> so Mill is aware of this, and he says, well... Here's what we need to distinguish is, you know, how do we understand this principle of utility? We can understand it two different ways, and he's a little unclear on if he goes with the act version or the rule version. You, know, you can look this up on the internet, too. Um, so when we talk about the principle of utility, we're talking about the utility of an action. That means we're talking about the consequences of the action. But that can be taken in two different ways. We could mean, what are the consequences of doing that general sort of thing as a rule? Like, what if everybody did it? There's like a rule of action, and we're not just doing it now, but we're always doing it. What would the overall outcome be of everybody doing this, everybody acting this way? Okay, that might be what we mean when we ask about the consequences of the action. You know, what would be the outcome of this being a general thing that people do? That's what we mean by as a rule of action.
A different thing, however, is to say, well, uh, what, are the, what are the consequences of this action? Maybe we just mean of me doing it right now, separate from everybody else doing it, or maybe separate from anybody else doing it. What are the consequences of me doing this now? Or whatever, whatever it might be, you know? Um, it could be declaring a major. It could be uh, deciding to get married. It could be deciding whether to keep a promise. Um, so the first thing to get clear here is you know, those are different things. Uh, the outcome of a single action on a single occasion could turn out to be utility maximizing. However, maybe when we look at the outcome of that kind of behavior done regularly, everybody does it. That's the rule of action, everybody does it. Uh, maybe that's not utility maximizing, right? You might have a utility maximizing single action where that rule of action isn't utility maximizing. But by the rule of action, I mean like everybody doing that thing in those circumstances. Go back to the doctor example. If every doctor did that, I don't know that I would be going to the doctor, right? If you didn't know whether or not you'd be one of those sacrificed patients, you would really think twice about going to the doctor. And uh, that doesn't seem like that would bode well for the overall happiness of mankind. If people become scared of going to the doctor because every doctor does that, that's not utility maximizing. So that's exactly what Mill wants to show. He wants to say, well, look, in these cases where it looks like the principle of utility is sanctioning immoral means to benefiting the greatest number of people as the goal, we can say this. Actually, it doesn't. Because when taken as a rule of action, these things aren't utility maximizing. But it's not utility maximizing to lie, even if right now you might kind of make everybody happiest if you did. But if everybody's always lying, or that as a rule people lie, that's not going to make, that's not going to have utility maximizing consequences. So it really isn't. Even though on these single occasions it looks like we can maximize utility by violating rights. Really, at the end of the day, respecting individual rights is generally utility maximizing on these kind of broader patterns, not just the individual action. So we can bring this together in a pretty sharp response in this way. Mill can say, in the face of this worry about these like rights violating or actions that are utility maximizing but violate rights, said, understand the principle of utility this way. An action is morally correct only if it's an example of a utility maximizing rule of action. So now you really have to show that the rule of action that your action right now is connected to, that that rule of action is utility maximizing. And we're putting the focus away from looking at the utility of what you're doing right now. But we have to decide really is the utility of that as a general rule of action. And what we see are these kinds of, you know, bad actions aren't generally utility maximizing, even if on a given day they might be. And let's go with the general rule. So that seems to kind of avoid the, the objection, just like this higher and lower pleasures seems to avoid the objection. So these are pretty nice moves by Mill. Um, as we saw, there's questions to be raised about his theory of higher and lower pleasures, and that means we might have questions to his response to objections to his theories. And now you can see we're kind of really getting a few layers deep in the back and forth of the debate and the analysis and the objections and responses to this philosophical theory, and that's really very essential to philosophical ethics. I mean, it gets complex, it really does, and sometimes you have to take breaks, but um, that's really what the kind of logical analysis of philosophy involves, is kind of really getting deep into these layers of argument, response, and critique then of the response to the objection, and so on.
<clears throat> so with acting rule utilitarianism, uh, is there a problem with that? Uh, there's a couple problems. One problem is that um, it's difficult to formulate the specific rule of action uh, for any particular action. We're going to go too much into that. It's kind of a technical matter. Um, another kind of funny, ironic kind of uh, implication of that is that rule utilitarianism turns out to be less utility maximizing than act utilitarianism precisely because of that respect for distribution and fairness. Um, and it seems kind of weird that a utilitarian theory uh, that you espouse as a utilitarian is less utility maximizing than one that you're turning down as the actual utilitarian. So, um, okay, we'll leave that at that. One thing we want to kind of get clear here are, you know, what are these distinctions between the theories themselves? As you can see, I've put them in a pretty complicated context, right, of introducing these theories and these distinctions as kind of moves in a philosophical debate, right? So we want to see the distinction between higher and lower pleasures comes in as a response to the doctrine of swine objection. Act and rule utilitarianism comes in as a response to the problem of distributive justice. Both of these are different kinds of objections that are raised to the principle of utility. Mill is now trying to kind of patch it up, refine it a little bit, so that the principle of utility stands. It's not subject to these objections, so he hopes. Okay, um, I'm actually going to pass on number nine, to be honest. Um, I'll just kind of invite you to just do a Google search on, or it doesn't have to be Google, whatever, uh, on the hedonic calculus. So just kind of take that in quotes, and you can you can find that. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting and just in the way that it shows the level of precision and specificity that the utilitarians developed their kind of ultimate theory with, you know, very precise. And it is important, actually, to see that uh, this is still widely used in economics. So, really, Bentham and Mill made a pretty considerable contribution to economics um, with the principle of utility, even if it kind of, like, falls victim to some philosophical objections, it turns out uh, to be pretty useful in economic theory. So let me get the next one here. Uh, 10. Why does Mill argue against using a moral theory based on motives? Okay, so some of this I'm going to get from Bentham as well. As well. Um, <clears throat> Bentham has this kind of odd statement where he says, basically, intentions and motivations are creatures of darkness. And by that he meant we know not of what we speak when we talk about the motive of a person or the person's intention. It's supposed to be this thing that kind of lives inside of their head and their brain or something like that, but we've never experienced another person's intention or motivation. We might experience the actions that that motivation produced, but their motive and intention is this kind of like immaterial mental thing that produces an action, and he thinks that's kind of like, you know, we can't really be sure that what that is at all. We've never experienced them. We certainly can't ever know for sure exactly what a person's real motivation is. So there's really two worries. One of them is kind of more fundamental. He's like, you know, for all we know, when we get like a more matured human psychology, what if it turns out that motives and intentions don't, they're not real things in the world? All we really have is kind of neurons and synapses and stuff like that, you know? Um, we really shouldn't base a moral theory on something whose very existence we have reason to question, right? So in a way, he's kind of saying, you know, these might be kind of part of like a common sense mythology that we've got these intentions and motivations. So... We shouldn't use those as the basis for evaluating a person, their intentions and motives. Another reason is that I've noted this earlier, is that 
intentions and motivations themselves don't produce any good or harm to other people. It's your actions that do. That's not the, the motive isn't the action. The motive is what causes the action. The action is something your body does, right? And maybe your mind is, so to speak, telling your body to do certain things when you act on an intention or you act on a desire or act on a motivation. But it's the bodily action that really is what's producing impacts on other people in the world, even speaking. You know, that's a bodily action that you do with your mouth, right? So the intention itself doesn't produce any direct good or harm. So that's another reason why we really shouldn't have a motivation-based theory. That's kind of counterintuitive because I think it's part of most people thinking about what a good or bad person is, is like, well, what's the motive that you're acting with? Are you acting with good motives or are you acting with bad motives? Pretty much enters into most people's thinking about, you know, is a person good or bad? And Mill, at some points, he'll say like, you know, there is that question to be asked. Is the person good or bad? And we can think about motivations when we're evaluating the person, but really what we should be asking as the most important question in ethics is not, are you a good person or a bad person, but is this, are your actions good or bad? The things that you actually do, are those good or bad? And he says, for that, let's leave the motivation out of it. Um, that's about real just consequences for real people not what you were trying to do or what you wanted to do or stuff like that. And maybe that is relevant to evaluating you know, what we think of you as a person. But really, the, most, the more important moral question for Mill is what the outcomes of our actions are. So that's a, that's a decent, decent response there. Okay, so let's go with this here. Um, finally, a couple more objections. Actually, number 12 uh, I've already gotten to in discussing the hierarchy of pleasures. So I'm going to kind of leave that. So it just leaves us with uh, 11 here. Um, and then one more, one more slide. Um, actually, looking at those, I've gotten a couple, gotten to a couple of those. Um, what is the too high for humanity objection to utilitarianism? How does Mill respond to this objection? This is pretty interesting. There's two different versions of the too high for humanity objection. This is kind of what it's called. The objection was this. This principle of utility is too high for humanity. Mill says, there have been people that have raised this objection. However, I can answer their objections. So what do they mean? <clears throat> to say that utilitarianism is too high for humanity means two things. It's, it's too demanding for us. It sets a standard that's just unrealistic. We really can't live up to it. And really, realistically speaking, we can't really expect a human being to do that. Um, the idea is this. <clears throat> the only way that you can really live up to the principle of utility is if you're constantly, constantly evaluating the well-being of the community, which includes lots of total strangers, just as much as you value yourself and your own family, because everybody's happiness has to factor into your utility calculations as much as everybody else's. You can't play favorites when it comes to maximizing happiness. You've got to take everybody into consideration equally. So that means the happiness of a stranger is just as important as the happiness of yourself and your own children, let's say. And you have to take that into consideration when you make an action, perform an action, in order to be acting morally correctly, in order to be acting according to the principle of utility. So that seems to be asking more than people are really capable of, and maybe even more than we would want them to be doing. Like We actually kind of generally think it's not only okay, but good to be promoting the well-being of your own family, maybe more than total strangers. I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a question. Um, 
But the more important thing here is that if that's what the principle of utility is demanding, that we always do that, then it's just an unrealistic standard. So it's too high for human beings. If we were gods or something like that, you know, maybe we could always do that. But uh, it doesn't seem to be the way that human beings operate. A little too high of a demand. So um, another object, another version of the too high for humanity objection is that it's too high for us, it's too demanding in the sense that the intellectual demands of this are too high. We can't calculate the effects of every action we take on all people that are going to be affected by it ever before we perform an action. It's just like, actually it gets really complicated really quickly. If you're, let's say, a, even in your own life, like what are the consequences of this action in my own life? Well, what about me and my friends? Me and my friends and my family? What if you uh, are a manager or an owner of a company or a government official? And you think like, oh, well, what are the impacts of my actions on other people? That's going to get really complicated really quick. So another sense of that the utilitarianism is too hard for humanity is that it's too intellectually demanding rather than being too morally demanding. That was the first version of it. You have to put other people's interests right alongside yours all the time, even strangers. So that's like too intellectually demanding. It's also maybe too, I'm sorry, that, that, my apologies, that's too morally demanding. Here we see, we might also say that it's too intellectually demanding. Now, I can't like go through these utility calculations before I perform every action. If the only way to perform a good action is to go through all of these utility calculations before I do it, my God, that's just demanding more than human beings can really intellectually compute and then go act. So now Mill responds to these, uh, each of these. It's pretty interesting. So for the moral demanding, is too high for humanity in the sense that it's too morally demanding because it means that we have to put everybody, even strangers, alongside ourselves on the moral scale when we go to act. Um, it says, well, you know, morality is hard work. Yeah, it's demanding. Uh, it's not going to be easy. And we can talk a bit. You know, how much, how closely do you approximate the ideal here? But uh, yeah, it's, it's hard work. We don't want to lower our standards too much because we're talking about the ultimate principles of morality. And we want to, we should have high standards, and it should turn out that morality is demanding, right? Morality is a demanding thing. It's not convenient. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be right. It's supposed to be good. It's supposed to be fair. It's supposed to be just. And yeah, that's, that's demanding. Um, for the intellectually demanding part, um, there's two things. We actually have these kind of nifty cultural rules of thumb, like a rolling stone gather, gathers no moss, something like that, little sayings, uh, words of wisdom, little sayings that we pass on from generation to generation. Uh, even like the golden rule, maybe, something like that. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Of course, it has biblical sources. But uh, sayings like that are ways that we really concisely and easily package in intellectually easy to understand ways, utility maximizing kinds of behavior, right? Um, so that gives us like the summary. Some people call these like summary rules. Instead of the full utility calculation, you can have rules of thumb that are easy to remember that pretty much get the utility right. And we kind of encourage people to behave in culturally customary ways that are easy to understand that generally turn out to be utility maximizing. That's kind of why they are culturally customary, right? And we can kind of just pass on the culture or pass on rules of thumb, little words of advice, you know, kernels of wisdom, and end up maximizing utility without needing to perform the utility calculation. I think that's actually kind of a neat response from Mill there. Um, Another thing is this. Think about consequentialism. Mill is a consequentialist. It's a good thing to try to determine and calculate all the consequences of your action before you act, but you don't have to do that in order 
to actually produce the right consequences. You know, you can do it without having the explicit plan to do it. So, I mean, strictly speaking, you don't have to calculate or even think about what the best outcome is for the greatest number or what's going to produce the greatest happiness for the greatest number, so long as you do it. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a thing that we can introduce here to explain this. We would say the utilitarian, because they're a consequentialist, only, respond, only requires that you act in accordance with the principle of utility, not that you act on the basis of it. You don't have to act on the basis of utility in order to be performing a good action. You only have to be acting in accordance with it. So some, you know, law is often like that. Think about um, speeding, something like that. You don't have to be thinking about the speeding law in order to be conforming to it, to be honoring the speeding law, right? So long as you're not speeding. You may be thinking about whatever you want to be thinking. As long as you're not speeding, you're following the law against speeding. So same for the principle of utility, really because you're a consequentialist, right? Um, it's not important what your motives are in the action or what, the, what you're thinking at all. It just matters that the actual consequences of your action really are this way. So it's kind of like the thing with speeding. So in that way, he said, you're kind of misunderstanding that a consequentialist like myself is putting the principle of utility out there as something that you need to take as the basis of your intention and your motives. I'm not. We don't recognize the importance of motives and intentions as utilitarians. So of course I'm not saying that. And it's kind of obvious that the utilitarian couldn't really say that if they're a consequentialist. So those are, that's how he would respond to the view that this is just too demanding. You have these two different kinds of uh, responses. Um, uh, one more version of the two demanding response, uh, the moral version of the two demanding response, that we have to care equally about strangers as ourself or our, our own child. Um, he says, you know, it, in theory, I mean, the utilitarian theory might obligate you to do things like, you know, donate to kind of charity blindly just to benefit humanity. But it says, really, this Mill says this. In practice, we generally bring about the greatest good for the greatest number when we act locally, so to speak. When we kind of, because we know who the people are, we know what they value, we know what will make them happy, and because it's within our you know, local environment, we've got the resources to like you know make it happen. So for the so, you know, this still kind of allows you to pay more attention to your friends and neighbors than to strangers, because that's really where we can generally make the most impact most of the time. When we think in terms of the people that we know, and that might help the, the worry that, you know, this is kind of like putting this on the line to care about strangers as much as ourselves. They would say, yeah, really, we kind of benefit utility more when we're kind of acting within the sphere of people that we know. Okay, so for number 12, the doctrine of swine objection and how would a utilitarian respond to it? I'm just going to link back to uh, the earlier question on the hierarchy of pleasures, the higher and lower pleasures. That's uh, got all that in there, so it's kind of a little duplicitous question. My apologies. Uh, let's go to our last one here, and uh, we're just going to look at 13. Uh, the last one I'll kind of just invite you to go ahead and think of applications of the principle of utility. Um, 13. Ah, you know, we did this too. Good. So um, this comes in what I was calling a problem of distributive justice. This is, uh, refer you back to the discussion on act versus rule utilitarianism. All of that is uh, described there. So between these last few slides, what we want to really see is that we've got this set of objections and responses that Mill, mostly Mill, is giving 
as part of a philosophical debate about how good or how plausible a utilitarian theory of ethics is, we started with questions and some slides that are just on the basic definitions of the terms, right? What is utilitarianism? What's utility? What's happiness? What's pleasure? What's like a instrumental value? What's an intrinsic value or an intrinsic good? And gradually got into more kind of sophisticated versions of the theory itself and the principle of utility and looked at some kind of like fine-grained distinctions that go into really expanding this as a theory. And then we looked at some pretty, you know, some of these were pretty tough questions that a defender of that utilitarian theory that we just laid out would have to, you know, have some intelligent responses to in order for us to really see utilitarianism as a plausible moral theory. I think you'd have to be able to have something to say to these objections, otherwise it seems like a kind of a not a good moral theory. And Mill, you know, it goes pretty far and does decently, at least, in showing how his theory of morality can withstand some of these challenges. And the ultimate uh, verdict on whether utilitarianism is good or bad, or the right way to go, whether we really should take this as our supreme principle of morality, really is left to you as a result of the kind of the debate and the objections and the responses, the things to see in favor of it, the arguments against it, uh, its merits, its drawbacks. At the end of the day, what do you think? So I'll kind of leave that to you, whether you ultimately think it's the right way to make our moral decisions. I'll say this. It certainly seems to give a nice, like, sophisticated version of at least one really core aspect of moral thinking is that we evaluate a good action and a bad action in terms of its consequences for the people, right? So there might be more to a full theory of ethics, and there probably is. Motives probably do matter, and we'll see that we will go on to explore a motive-based theory, but um, this is at least an attempt to ground an entire moral theory on that intuitive idea that good and bad is about good and bad consequences of our actions. So this is what it would look like to try to kind of run with that and make a whole theory of it, and some of the kind of challenges that you would encounter along the way. So here with number 14, um, I'm going to leave that to you. I mean, we've got a lot of morally significant <laughs> actions in our world at the moment, and you know, you could look at the news any day of the week uh, any, and, and ask yourself, you know, does this action seem to be utility maximizing or not? I think what I want to get across here is just like, what's the thought process that you would go through to really apply this principle of utility? One thing that Mill and Bentham really thought that was to the advantage of the principle of utility, and you know, we've been seeing there's some questions about it, but they thought it's a very useful theory, as they would say, it's very wieldly. You can put it into practice, right? You can go to real life situations and boom, you can see there's this call, you know, this impact on these people, this impact on these people, and then we can kind of look at the overall thing. If we do A, then if we do decision B, we could say like, oh, that would have this impact on these people, this on this, and put it together. That's the impacts of decision B. Should we do A or B? You know, we should be able to get an answer. So you know, if we looked at legislation or our own private decisions, should we do A or should we do B, we should be able to kind of like just apply the principle of utility and um, get a comparison of the utility of action A, utility of action B, and make real decisions. They thought this is good for real decision making. Now, I'll just finish with this. You know, these criticisms of utilitarianism would suggest that that as the only kind of decision making might have some flaws if it's kind of missing out on some morally important things. But here I'm kind of just asking you to see like, well, what would it look like if we could kind of apply this to a real case? Like, uh, you know, the example that I gave of the will. You know, what if you were to plan a will or to be a doctor and you were to use the principle of utility as your only guide? How would you do it? All right, so I'll uh, kind of leave it on that and hope that was helpful.